Hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, August 11th. Um, this is the community call. So I'm excited. Uh, in general, today we are going to have uh, an external presentation. We have Antoine hopping in to, to present some of his uh, research in deliberative decision making and talk about what he's working on in the in the Web3 space or thinking about how that relates to Web3. And then we'll have a discussion on that with our community. And yeah, just quickly before we uh, I pass it off to Antoine, I just want to give a moment to do some plugs uh, and to uh, yeah just cover some uh, some other things that are coming up. I believe there are a couple of guild uh, matters coming up. So I'll quickly, I see Brian is already off mute. So Brian, if you want to hop in and quickly mention those updates. Yeah, sure. Tomorrow we have the uh, let me bring up the event calendar. Do where is tomorrow? It? Friday, okay. August twelfth. Yeah, thanks. So uh, ten a.m. Pacific time is the Source Cred Guild meeting. And we're going to be, uh, that's an open uh, meeting. Pa uh, Paul, do you want to provide some context for that one? Yeah, happy to do so. So we have source cred operating at this point just on the forum as a way to incentivize quality contributions to the forum and the discussions that are happening there. And as part of our uh, instance of source cred, uh, we are building a guild from the community to help manage this. Uh, so currently we have $5,000 that we distribute every single month. And uh, we are kind of making some changes to the parameters and we're kind of doing this as a community. And so the guild meetings are a monthly meeting of people interested in our implementation of source cred and how we would like to change some of the parameters, if we should change the parameters, how we want to reward what types of behaviors and things like that. There have been some very good discussions. Uh, there is also a uh, post on the forum, an unsolicited post on the forum from one of the developers of SourceCred, kind of also discussing kind of what Scurf is doing and um, how our source credit is working. We'll also I'll put in the chat some documentation about our instance as well. But it is a really great opportunity if you are interested in incentive mechanisms, if you're interested in what SCURF is up to, if you're interested in how do you have good quality conversations. Um, I think that that is just generally a fun guild to be part of in general. Uh, and Brian and I are also going to be trying to encourage people to um, start experimenting with some models. Uh, so that's one of the things we're going to start talking about uh, tomorrow is how can we build some payout models and um, discuss what that would potentially incentivize or not. So it's a cool guild to be part of. Awesome. Yeah, thank you both for, for plugging those. Really excited, uh, yeah, to just see the, the uh, interest and enthusiasm from the community around that as well. So do please make sure to, uh, to join those or to reach out to Paul or Brian if you have any questions or want to learn more. Uh, yeah, and as mentioned, uh, links will be dropped in the chat here with some more color as well. Uh, one other quick plug, we had a round of reading groups this week. We just had the Impact Networks Part 1 reading group earlier today. We will be doing Part 2 of Impact Networks on August Wednesday, August 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's UTC minus 4. Uh, so that will be Round 2 of the, the SCURF reading group. Uh, and a reminder that you can currently go on the forum and we'll drop a link to the reading group post as well, but you could vote on which book we'll be reading next. It, it's between Laura Shin's The Cryptopians, uh, Camila Russo's The Virtual Machine, and Kia Krutler's Radical Friends. So we're currently voting on those for the September book. Uh, and then the not an officially SCURF reading group, but there's a number of SCURFers in it for the what I'm now thinking of as kind of the open science reading group. Uh, we're currently reading Reinventing Discovery. We're going to have part two of that reading group on Tuesday, August 23rd at 9 a.m. Uh, if you are interested in either one of those, please DM me or Inesh on Discord or shoot me an email. Um, so I think those are, I will quickly pause in case there's anyone else from SCURF who does have a relevant announcement, but otherwise I think we are ready to get on with the, uh, the main programming for the afternoon, morning, evening, wherever folks are in the world. Yeah, so I do want to black oh, please, a little it. thing. Um, so uh, we will have uh, the first uh, community strengthening uh task for <laughs> meeting um where various um people interested or working on the community side of scurf uh, can come around and discuss some very fundamental issues in terms of uh community and culture uh, such as like what is like the cultural identity of 
Scare from Hell, it relates to Web3 cultures and practicing tools for engagement, various stuff, um, and some more um, uh, specific uh, issues. So if everybody, if anybody is um, interested, let me know so we can come to you in. Perfect. Thank you, Fotis, for reminding about that. We'll have to know when that's just getting kicked off. So yeah, please feel free to reach out to Fotis as well. Um, and yeah, we'll start dropping some posts in chat. But with that, Antoine, please uh, feel free to hop on and give your, give an introduction. Uh, and then yeah, let's uh, let's jump into it. Excited for the discussion and hearing from you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, first question: Can you hear me well? Yes, coming through loud and clear. So then I will share my, my screen as a support to um, what I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> can you see my screen? It's coming up. Yes, now we can. OK. So indeed, the, the first uh, slide is on me. So um, I'm Antoine Verne. Uh, I'm co-director at Mission Public. And Mission Public is a, a team. We are 20. And we work on uh, deliberative processes. I will come back to that. And we do that since almost 20 years. Uh, and since 10 years, I'm um, working at Mission Public to implement deliberative processes from local to global. And before that, why I came to that is because 1998, I had a kind of revelation um, that I discovered that in the Athene of the uh, 2,400 years ago, um, decision makers were randomly selected. Uh, the boule, the, the main body for uh, decision preparation before all decision came to the assembly of the citizens, were prepared by a group of 500 uh, Athenian, randomly selected through from the population. And that was a, a kind of a shock and a, a discovery. And that's one of my um, motivation in life is to understand how and, and what we can do with random selection as a mechanism of decision making. Um, and I translated that into my job because when we do deliberative processes, uh, what we do the most often is randomly select a group of citizens, gather them together and give them time to discuss and to get information, to get um, very um, diverse information before proposing, making a recommendation for policy or a recommendation for a collective decision. Uh, so that's my one life. The other life is what you see above the, <laughs> the blue line is um, the Crypto Web 3 life. And back in 2011, I mined a couple of Bitcoin on a computer. And then I decided to switch to um, SETI uh, research. So giving my um, computer time to search for extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. I'm not sure that was the be best decision of my life because we haven't found uh, any extraterrestrial life uh, today. So maybe I would have uh, been better off with more Bitcoin. But then my second discovery of um, Crypto Web 3 was in 2017 with the World Computer uh, and Ethereum. And since then, I've been uh, engaging a lot in many um, discussions, um, um, communities around um, crypto, blockchain, Web 3. And um, there is something that links um, both um, of those um, realms, if I say, and that's governance. And I will talk about that um, today. So what's the issue? The issue is when you want to build a bridge, um, you need um, some you need things. And um, at different time in space and um, in time, you have needed different things and you had access to different things. So if you take the, the antique, you, you needed stones and slaves and an architect. Um, but if you scroll back to the 21st century, you need steel and workers, you need architects, more than one. You need engineers, you need um, citizen consultation. You need a lot of, of things that are different, but you build a bridge. Um, and so you, you take um, a bridge which is adapted to uh, the century, uh, the place uh, you live in. So the question for me is, what is a relevant and high quality tool for decision making in the 21st century? And that's an easy question, <laughs> but very difficult to answer. Um, my hypothesis and what I will uh, share with you today is that a kind of mix uh, of blockchain governance, deliberative governance, and aleatorian governance could do the trick. Um, so 
And to do that, I, I'll try to um, propose to run through what is a decision making, actually, uh, if we talk about decision making, how we access existing processes, um, and why do deliberative uh, and aleatorian and crypto web three uh, model have a potential to deliver? Um, so decision making is who gets what, when, who, and why. That's the shortest de de um, definition possible for a decision making. Um, so if we focus on on who, uh, what is the decision making? It's moving from many options to one option, so the left side versus the right side. And what you need is a procedure for selection. And in the literature and um, in, in uh, research, you mainly come by with four main procedures of selection if you want to do a typology. The first one is the vote. The second one is a market. The third one is what we can call examination. And the fourth one is random selection. And each of them have a tool uh, to produce that reduction. So with a vote, you aggregate the preferences of the actors through suffrages and an algorithm, which can be minority, uh, majority vote, two-third vote, consensus, a weighted uh, majority vote. So you have a, a lot of algorithm uh, to do that aggregation. With the market, um, you confront the preferences until the balance is reached through the price. The price will be the tool for coming from many options to one. In the examination, you will have criteria that will define uh, how you come from many options to one. So if you want to select someone, it could be upon merit, uh, it could be upon need, uh, it could be about, uh, because of birth, so that's the aristocracy, uh, and you could uh, find criteria for making that choice. And the fourth one is the um, random selection with an aleatory moment. So if we take now an example in the blockchain, and that's uh, to make it uh, already connected to our discussion today. Um, so for example, if you take a weighted simple majority uh, for proposal on Cosmos, um, that's um, something that is existing, that's a vote. If you auction an NFT on OpenSea, it will be a market mechanism. Um, if you discuss to draft a proposal, which goes to a vote on snapshot, that's going to be an examination of arguments. Um, and if you um, do a weighted random selection among validators for, to choose a block producer, that's a random selection, weighted random selection, and that's what you have on Polkadot, for example. So all those different methods of selection are also used in the blockchain um, space. So yes, now if you, that's the, the whole, um, how you decide. And um, now why you do it? And every time we use, and as a human community, a decision making, we say we do it because, and we find a way to justify the, the reason why we use a specific mechanism. And it can be efficiency, it can be transparency, it can be quality. And each and every time we will say, okay, we use that mechanism because it's the fairest, because it's the most efficient. So there is always, um, always a narrative around uh, a procedure of selection, uh, which is not the procedure of selection itself, because you can justify different selections with, with the same arguments in a way. Because for example, if you take random selection, or one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, you both you can say, okay, it's because of equality. So that's a layer of intellectual uh, work of uh, consensus, uh, uh, social consensus. And then there is a third element, of course, in a decision making, it's the why. It's why, um, how do we interpret the result? And basically in history, you have had three main ways of interpreting results. The finalist one, which is more um, about, okay, there is a superior force uh, behind the result. So if you would uh, toss a coin, it would be the will of the God. Um, you have a second interpretation, which is about uh, deterministic uh, interpretation, which was very um, prominent in the 19th century saying, okay, um, the cause and consequences, and you, you could uh, find all causes for all consequences. And there is a, um, the actual more um, spread interpretation, which is a probabilistic one, meaning, okay, this is uh, from coming from the quantum theory and saying okay, there is a probability that something uh, happens, and that's more the interpretation for today. Now, 
who is taking decision for whom? And that's the interesting part when we want to talk about um, decision making and governance um, of the um, collective human and, and communities. Um, and basically, we can come back to Aristoteles uh, with that. And um, we say, it, of course, you can have one, you can have a few, uh, or you can have many, and you can, of course, cross that. And you can say you have, uh, so on the left side, one person, few person, or many a person deciding for one person, some person, or many person. And you can add a bit of complexity um, because you can dis cross that with the kind of decision making you have. So if some uh, take decision, uh, how do you select those few, happy few that are going to take the decision? And here you see again the four um, decision making processes that can be used. And at the crossroad, you have a kind of a ideal type uh, of um, processes of systems for decision. And of course, these are, this is an intellectual construction and th these are ideal types, so um, not completely um, real, but they, they, they show um, um, an intuition, they show a direction and they allow to do a good categorization. And I have highlighted uh, three of them, the, the red ones, which are more or less the mix uh, we can find nowadays in our um, Western democracies, liber liberal democracies, uh, where you have um, some uh, few people uh, voting uh, for some other few people that are interested when uh, voter turnout is very low, so it's a kind of representative government. Or sometimes you have many people um, or some people um, and, and governing for many people that could be the representative democracy if it could work well, but in between you have what we uh, also have in our systems, which um, is uh, competence based on uh, a lot of uh, few people based on their competence, so the bureaucracy and deciding for more or less everyone. Now, if we look at um, at the Web3 and crypto governance world, uh, I've tried to, to map it. Um, and here you have the, the green and the yellow. The green is the idea, so that um, is the purpose, or that is the, the wish, that is the, the vision of DAOs is to be from everyone to everyone. But what we see at the moment in many DAOs is that you have a system which is more uh, many uh, for the few, um, and that the main mechanism which is uh, used is a market one. Um, so we have uh, something which is not maybe completely aligned with the vision. And if we look at the um, the green one on the bankless Web3 narrative, decentralization narrative, what we see in, in, indeed is that we have something which is more uh, something around benevolent dictators or um, with uh, hierarchies that are, that are there, or even nepotism um, in, in some cases. Um, so there is, um, I think, um, a, a gap uh, between the theory of uh, Web3 and the truth that what we have today in terms of governance when we um, talk about Web3 is our more nepotic systems where you have apathy, uh, lower uh, voter apathy, which is not better than actually what they wanted to replace with uh, representative democracy um, and it kind of tech aristocracy. Also, you have low quality discussions um, and sometimes you may have some corruption. Actually, it's a bit like representative democracy, but, but there is an answer that has been uh, proposed um, for the limitation against the limitation of representative democracy, and this has been deliberation. I will take a deliberation is a is a field or sometimes called citizen participation, sometimes called aleatory democracy. Um, it has many names, but I will take one example um, which shows um, what it what it looks like in reality. So it has been used more and more since over forty years uh, around the world. This is an example called the Citizens um, Initiative Review and how it works. Um, when a measure uh, in Oregon, uh, in the US, is put to the ballot, um, a citizen's initiative, so people uh, gather um, um, signature to put a, a ballot to be voted, um, and they gather enough, and then it puts, it's put to the ballot for all electors to decide if they want to see that measures accepted or rejected. And before this vote, uh, a group of 20 um, citizens are randomly selected in the state and they hear pros and cons of that measure from supporters and from opponents and they have five to six days 
to um, discuss with another, ask questions, inform themselves, and then they deliver a statement. And that statement is put in the pamphlet, which is given to all Oregon voters. And that's very interesting, because here you have a deliberative process, which is combined with a direct democratic process of vote. And um, there has been very good research on, on that um, initiative review. And what you see is that, um, so if we take the two on the left, uh, where people have been um, shown the, the measure um, and asked in the street um, if they are more likely to vote um, if they know that there has been a citizens' initiative review, uh, you see that 40%, uh, 30% uh, when you ask them on the street just like that, say that yes, um, they, they have a highly higher likelihood to vote um, because they know that other citizens have take time uh, to uh, think about it. And if you ask people um, what was um, important in their decision uh, when they voted, um, around 40 to 50 percent say the pamphlet, uh, so the, the, the conclusion of the citizens' uh, jury by my fellow citizens was the most important uh, argument for me in my choice. So that's a, a, there is a proxy for legitimacy and for um, democracy in those groups of deliberation. Another example that you may know is the participatory budgeting, uh, where um, a city, uh, sometimes a state, um, puts part of the budget aside uh, for citizens to decide what is going to be um, done with it. And normally the process is that you have people gathering in assemblies, discussing potential measures to pay with that money, and having a system of um, deliberation also, and at the end a vote to decide uh, which uh, measures are going to be financed. What you see, there is also very good research on that, is that um, you, the financing um, of uh, one of the most known cases is in Porto Alegre in, in Brazil, and after 15 years of participatory budgeting, you had a health care which was uh, much, much better, much less corruption, and a lot of um, indicators that were much better in terms of human development. So that's participatory budget. So now if we try to do the bridge, that's my bridge of the beginning, is what is the bridge here? Um, so I think that um, in the Web3 has a very high potential um, to scale um, human collaboration um, because it has that blockchain technology, it has the immutability and all the advantages we know about uh, Web3 and Web3 governance, decentralization, um, and, and incentives mechanism. Um, but now, what it is if we try to um, connect both? Um, if we take a DAO, um, we could say, okay, um, here. Uh, so that's uh, the, the, the conclusion <laughs> of, of the, the presentation, in a way, is that you, you, try, to, if you try to connect uh, the kind of the, the types of decisions. So you have the vote, the market, the random selection. And if you um, try to understand what kind of decision a DAO has to take, uh, you could start mapping um, decision-making processes with deliberation or without, uh, with vote or without, uh, with random selection or without, that could be adapted and used in certain cases for decision-making of uh, DAOs. And that could help improve the decision-making process of DAOs and help them scale beyond Web3. And here you see that this is a table which is uh, half empty. Uh, and the reason is that it's the beginning. Um, it's something I have started um, to present and discuss. Um, now the, the goal is to get constructive critic, to test and fire test the, the concept, to refine the model, uh, and to find a DAO or, or a chain that want to test that approach of trying to put in place deliberative on-chain, deliberative processes, pilots, um, and um, go on with the research. So that's um, where I am. Uh, I have tried to do uh, an example. Um, what it could uh, look like, for example, with, in, in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, we could take a proposition with a rather long-term voting period, which could be a controversial one. So uh, Juno 16, for example. Um, and um, then we could have a citizen's track uh, where we invite uh, a drop of an NFT, a a set of stakers to join a three hour discussion of the proposal. We could run that mini deliberative process and we can have a recommendation that we, we could put in the description when it goes online for the vote. And at the same time, we could have a Naristoy track, so the, the track for uh, the most competent people uh, with pros and cons with validators. 
um, and have their, um, their information. And then we would push the results as part of the voting presentation. And so people could um, decide with may maybe a, a different um, set of information to take their decision. So that's an example. Um, as a wrap up, current governance systems are not up to the test for the 21st century. I talked a lot about Web3 and limitations, but the same goes for representative democracy. It's not uh, up to the task. Um, and I think that deliberative aleatorian democracy coupled with Web3 has a very strong potential. Um, and that's, yeah, the end of my presentation. Cool, thank you, Antonia. Thank you for walking us through that. That was, uh, yeah, that was great. And please, for, for anyone, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or, or raise your virtual okay. hand. Uh, and I'll start with kind of a, a general question while other folks are just processing and, and coming up with their own. But um, just wondering, actually, if yeah, if Richard, if you already got your hand up, please jump in. Oh, you're muted, though. Sorry, I didn't mean to ruin your flow. Um, I've been working on DAOs for years and years and years. I was the head of community at MakerDAO for, uh, since its inception. So I, I got a chance to see a lot of these questions asked and answered um, up close. And so I come to this conversation with tons and tons of baggage. But one of the things, maybe we can start off with, um, uh, if you ask a room full of people whether they think that agency is a good thing and whether they want to have control of the over the environment in which they work or they govern a particular project. Um, in my experience, nine times out of 10, people will say, of course we do. It's self-evident. Um, uh, then you say, okay, well, here's all the work that is required in order to achieve that agency. Um, one out of 10 people stick around. And so uh, here's how we, here's the question for you, I guess, is how do you assemble a group uh, maybe I'll take one step back. So um, if you want to go back to the, the Grecian models, so you have a population that has a very in, deeply embedded sense of civic responsibility. And then you draw from that pool of resources in order to govern. Um, in DAOs, I'm not entirely sure that that groundwork has been laid. So how, how do you form a group of aligned actors, say, here's the cost of agency get to work you know, with a reasonable expectation that people would be dedicating that, that number of hours a week in order to to make to govern things effectively. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Richard. I think that's the that's the key, and that's a bit also the the parallel I would do um, almost one to one with uh, with democracy. You know, if you ask people, is democracy important? Is participation important? And all people would say, yeah, it's very important. And then you you ask people, do you want to come to the town hall meeting? And they won't come. <laughs> so we, we have the kind, and I see a very strong parallel, uh, which is of course um, due to the the busyness of people in our uh, in our society. And the answer of uh, deliberative processes to that is random selection plus incentives plus a very uh, short um, time. So what you ask people when when we do such a citizen story, we ask them for four days. Um, and then that's it for their life, uh, because they have played their role of citizen in a way, uh, and they will rotate. And we ask them to to answer to one question, and then we say, and and then the chance that you'll be picked again is a zero point zero 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 one percent, and and that's and that's the the thing. So if I had to gather in a DAO a group, um, or with from a community. It would be with random selection, a group, uh, a, a little group. So it's not about um, it's about agency with proxy, and that's I think that's the key. The key is to to create a, a process for which people have the, the feeling that they can um, they can stay behind the, the legitimacy. That's that's a question of representation, represent yeah representation actually, a political representation. And, and that works very well. If you look at the experience of uh, deliberative democracy and you ask people if they feel represented by randomly selected groups of people, it's a huge yes. Uh, and that's a, that's a good news because they see the process um, and they see the, the, the value of it. And so they are able to, to stay behind. At the same time, of course, you have to, to, to design a very good um, uh, balance between the incentives you give to those people to engage in that discussion the time they have to invest and the the set of rewards that they have being part of the discussion 
but not having to invest too much time. And then they can go back to their occupation and that's okay. Um, what we know from research is that 95% um, of people that have gone through such a process become politically active. Uh, they do stuff afterwards. So it's a, not before, <laughs> but after, it's a powerful activator at the same time. And that's a big question that stays a question. Um, also in deliberative processes is that we have a turnout to our uh, recruitment, random uh, selection recruitment, which is 40% when you have a, a good topic uh, for which people can really connect to three, four percent when, when the topic doesn't work or when they have the feeling that the decision is already taken. So we also have, we also have to do many efforts for recruitment. I think, well, I, I see more hands coming up, but I want to take the opportunity just to do a follow-up question too. So, um, and I've also noticed that, well, obviously there's a, a wide spectrum of types of DAOs and in these types of DAOs, um, they optimize for a specific type of outcome. So you have everything from reputation to um, protocol DAOs, um, protocol you know, being more of a uh, business or uh, managing some kind of uh, common or good in the commons is on the other end of the spectrum, I suppose. And um, the frameworks required to execute effectively for these different types of DAOs are different. And so um, you mentioned feeling of, of participatory feeling. So people feel seen or feel engaged or feel involved in a process and they're more likely to return and engage again. Um, so there's this notion of how do we maximize for engagement as engagement being the thing that you're outputting. So we want to maximize for engagement, that's great. Um, how how effective are the results though, uh, frequently? So um, if you get a committee of random citizens to make a decision about some budgeting issue, have you been tracking, is the result of that process more effective than a smaller group of uh, bespoke experts that try to come up with the same solution? Yes, it is, uh, and that's because of the wisdom of crowds um, and um, that you, you are most um, uh, familiar with. So if you ask uh, yeah. the people on the chair you know, uh, to, to weight the, the baggage and uh, if you take the mean of everyone, you will have the right uh, one. If you take a group of experts, uh, <laughs> you, you won't have the, the same result. So that's, the, that's because of the cognitive diversity you put in the group. And, and with that, you, you higher the probability of having a better outcome in terms of decision. Um, but it's also something that is um, that is because of the, the consensus making. So people need to, to enter in a discussion indeed and, and, and in a deliberative process very often you do it uh, being online but you do it in synchronous, face-to-face uh, -face or online but synchronous. So people need to engage with other um, and that's a discussion and it's a moderated process normally. We, we have moderators to do that. Um, so what you 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 do is you force people to to try to find a solution and that's a, also a very powerful driver so it, it doesn't happen by itself it's a moderated process it's a process with a, a design uh, that comes from uh, the learning the finding the common ground finding the things you don't you agree that you don't agree uh, that's a very important thing and and there are a couple of methods to to go through that process so in a DAO, the operational overhead is shifted away from decision making for the DAO itself to facilitating actors to make those decisions for you. It's still a significant amount of work, though, isn't it? So that's that's one solution. Uh, but sometimes, what you have, if I if I again I mirror with what we we do in uh, with uh, cities, regions, um, ministries, and 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 countries, and um, what you, you can have some of those deliberative exercises being about give you give us so decision makers. Um, uh, ask people to give them a vision of where they should go. Uh, what is the what is the, the end goal? For example, we just did a, a process at European level with randomly selected citizens from the EU 27 uh, member states, 800 of them, and they gave a, a vision and they, they made 50 proposals for on the future of Europe. And they delivered that to the Commission and the Parliament. And now the Parliament and the Commission, so the politicians um, and the bureaucracy, are in charge of transforming that into uh, very uh, more low laws and European law and European action plans and that kind of thing. So you can have a higher level discussion. 
but also we, we also had some uh, processes of deliberation where, where it was about the budget of a city. Um, and the, the citizens uh, decided the big um, expense, and then the city council approved those big groups, and then the administration uh, had to, to do it. So well, this is a bit the table I presented at the end. For me, it's the very beginning of thinking about what could be good um, tools. If we think about the meta level of what is a decision we need to take and what kind of process we can use, we have, uh, so my, my hypothesis is we have much more Did I freeze or did we lose uh, Oh, there he is. So you froze there for the last sentence, if you don't mind uh, okay. repeating that one real quick. So I think we, we need to, to tap into the diversity of decision-making processes uh, to, 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 to match the, the needs of uh, organizations of the 21st century. That's, that's my, my first point. All right, thanks for the insights. Thank you for sharing. I know, Paul, you had your virtual hand up next. Please jump in. Yeah, I'm also kind of very interested in kind of this random nature. I imagine the reason why this is potentially increasing engagement with people is once you're pulled into something, you feel like you have some responsibility, even if you would not have volunteered to do that. But like once you've been tasked, you like, now I have to do that. Um, in some ways, this sounds a little bit like in the US, the system of jury duty of, you know, randomly assigning citizens uh, from a political unit, and it is now your responsibility to decide if uh, something is just or not. Um, I do know in some of the research, I don't know it deeply, but like a expert uh, in law, though, might be able to make a more accurate, maybe not a quicker, uh, maybe not a more just, uh, but maybe a more legally accurate um, type of decision. So I'm kind of wondering how um, how we might be able to do some hybrid stuff here. Because I think that that is what your point is, that, there's, that it's not just like, let's rely on the random, but we're doing some hybrid stuff here. But um, I'm kind of wondering, like, uh, what are the outputs that we're maybe maximizing around and things like that? So I'm sorry, Paul, but I lost the, the connection for a second, uh, actually. So can you repeat the, the question? I'm sorry. Sure, I'll try to do a shorter version of it this time too. So uh, it's kind of like um, jury duty in the US, like jury duty, yeah. you know, you're kind yeah. of randomly assigned people to a task. Now they have to do a thing. Um, but sometimes a legal expert will make a more legally accurate analysis, uh, maybe not more just uh, to the community, but more accurate. So um, it's ultimately like this is about making hybrids so that we can get closer to different types of outcomes or um, Basically, like what types of outcomes are we after? Are we after accuracy? Are we after engagement? Like things along those lines. Is that kind of where you're at? So yeah, exactly. The hybrid. So the 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 idea is how do we maximize that balance between legitimacy of a decision, um, which is based on on engagement, which is based on transparency, but also on on the quality of the discussion, um, and and efficiency. So you you have to find strike that balance. And sometimes, of course. Um, if we think about uh, a constitution for a DAO, the process where, where you don't need uh, the full community. Thank you. I think you cut out a little bit, but like if I'm yeah. interpreting correctly, there are certain situations where you need this for legitimacy and engagement um, and like as a DAO or as an organization, you would be making choices of we need accuracy and therefore we would use this process when we need accuracy. We would use a different process when we need engagement. And that's kind of, is that kind of correct where you were going? And Antoine, please feel free to kill your video to help bandwidth if that would be helpful. I don't know what happens. Um, normally, it's quite stable here. No worries, yeah. I don't know if you caught Paul's recap. Um, otherwise, let's see, Antoine, are you with us at this point?
unfortunately the network seems to be cutting in and out. Um, yeah, let us know once you can hear us again, Antoine. Um, but yeah, it's also interesting to, to think in that sense, because uh, I know in, in reading Reinventing Discovery, which we're reading uh, in a different uh, book club, and we're kind of chatting about collective intelligence around research funding and thinking similarly around deliberative decision making, right? That that's an area where it's actually tough for people without a certain amount of a base knowledge to successfully vote on, say, whether a certain type of you know, hyper-focused uh, particle physics, whatever kind of project should be funded or not. Like if you don't have a certain type of uh, background knowledge, uh, it can be challenging to actually know what to vote on in the first place. And so what are like hybrid models that can try to accommodate some of that? Um, but yeah, John, um, yeah, it seems like uh, Antoine, uh, Antoine, can you hear us? Seems like we might've lost Anton, but Jonathan, if you wanted to, uh, at least jump in for now and yeah, just stay what's on your mind and we can at least chat about it and hopefully Antoine will, will come back and, and can hop in as well. Sure. Uh, so this came up several, I, I missed the beginning, so forgive me if this was already mentioned, but I don't think it was. And it came up a couple times already. Uh, we're using the word feel like you're involved or feel like you have a say. And I'm just curious uh, how much of this is dependent on a, a participant feeling like they're involved and actually being involved like are we developing DAOs and systems where you know i have all the actual technical voting power but i happen to operate in a way that lets other people feel like they're in control but at the end of the day if i want to do anything i want i can so i guess another way to ask that question is how are we keeping corruption out of the system no but that's that's very that's very interesting because this is for me one of the the key advantages of decentralized uh, on-chain governance and online and, and blockchain spirit and web3 uh, mode of doing and um, is that indeed in, de in, in deliberative um, democracy in representative democracy or liberal democracy that effect of um it it for a long time it stopped at that um you you give people the feeling that they have participated, but you don't give the final um, say to people uh, or to the full community. And I think here, there is a huge potential for blockchain governance um, to step in and have something much more stronger in terms of um, implementing the results of such uh, processes of, of deliberation, where people don't just don't, it's not about just having the feeling, but it's about having the, that agency and the power uh, to, to implement things. Are there like substantive ways to actually do that? Every system I've seen so far on blockchain is um, giving the feeling of control and actually retaining control for a few early movers, so to speak. And that's again, Jonathan, I think the advantage of deliberation, that with deliberation, you could, um, you could ex extend um, that um, that that scope of uh, inclusion in the governance uh, process. All right. Cool. Thanks. I also wonder how much of that is just the lack of maturity of governance design in most of Web three, where up until the last year, it's been so much copy paste someone else's, and there hasn't actually been like how do we maximize useful outcomes. And in the last year, year and a half, there's been a lot more thinking of it. And I know I, I don't want to cut in front of Umar, but I know like I'm excited to ask, uh, I'll jump in afterwards officially, uh, but around like optimism and some other concrete examples where, you know, we only just started seeing bicameral houses as something that's, you know, been around for ages in terms of uh, regular political thinking. And yet in the Web3 space has just emerged, like how much do we just need to mature and come up with more complex uh, structures and whatnot? Um, but yeah, sorry, Umar, I, I want to- So hold, hold on, uh, can I respond to that really quick? Sure. In the same vein, it's um, it doesn't necessarily depend on the actual structure of the governance. So in the U.S., for example, you have the two parties and it's representative democracy, but ultimately you move on the same path regardless of which party's in power because the system itself is run by sort of root principles of the economics. So we have a capitalist system where we have a military industrial complex and that's going to fight to sustain itself. So you can put in as much democracy as you want, representative, participatory, budgeting, all that stuff. But the if the, the culture 
if the the root of the system is the same and blockchain will not it's a technology it's not going to change that culture if that culture doesn't change then it doesn't really matter i think that's what i'm trying to get at maybe agent to uh, i wanted to say something to yes my wish is that we, uh, the blockchain space fast forward to to new innovations in decision making and doesn't have to go through the 150 years of rep representative government to fail at the end, as we are seeing with our representative governments, as Jonathan, you were noting. So that's the, the idea is to leapfrog. <laughs> but 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 in a way, that, that's the drama. Because if you look at the governance tool of Polkadot, uh, it's again, it's more voting and more referendum. Uh, where you say, uh, OK, um, uh, interesting, but that's not a really uh, innovation there. Yeah, I agree. It'll be very interesting to watch. This is a fun discussion. Thank you. Umar, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I, I think uh, one really interesting thing is like the amount of context someone needs in order to make the decision. And uh, something that uh, is really interesting with the jury example to me is like, um, as Eugene brought up, that sort of like common praxis or base of knowledge of like, if you're selecting a group of people and you want to select them from this uh, group of people with a shared uh, praxis, um, and I'm curious uh, how something like that would really work for peer review, where maybe you have, you know, you select people who are all in the field of biology to review a biology paper. Um, but then there's that element of cognitive diversity. And I'm curious, like, what would a physicist's view on a biology paper be? And I'm really curious, are there any research studies that show, like, the uh, accuracy or the, the 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 quality of the decision making relative to the amount of diversity and like especially as you reach higher and higher levels of diversity does that really improve the decision or does it start to deteriorate um and then uh sort of building off of a bit of what eugene and john were just talking about um is like this sort of like temporal scale of decision making where it's like it, this is more maybe government than science but uh if you have someone in the same position and they gain that context and they gain that knowledge um uh, would it be more valuable then to keep them in that position or to uh, elect a new um, or, or or to randomly select a, a a new person who might have less context? And I guess this is something DAOs struggle with as well, where they're always like, sorry for the ramble, where they're always like, just like, uh, you know, really trying to maximize the amount of local context. Um, yes, thanks, Uma. On the, on the diversity thing, um, we run um, a research uh, and innovation project uh, in the within the European Union a couple of years ago where we had citizens uh, make the research program for the European Union. So the, there is this Horizon 2020 program, which is a 50 billion research program of the European Union. And we, we designed um, this, the main um, areas of research with randomly selected citizens. And that was very interesting because indeed uh, the topics that came out for uh, research were not the the standard ones were things that were very uh, interdisciplinary, uh, very long term, uh, very interesting. So that's not per se what you were asking. Uh, but indeed, when you bring um, that piece in a research process, you, you, you find very interesting uh, novelty and, and it's very interesting to do it. Uh, but I don't know of exactly studies about, about that. Uh, but it, it would be fascinating to, uh, I, I'm on it, I'm, uh, I'm on board for such a, an experiment. I think it would be fantastic. <laughs> And then, um, and the, your second uh, point, I, I didn't note it, so I, I forgot it. Uh, that one was more of a ramble anyway. Um, but maybe to, to rephrase it shortly, uh, if you're randomly selecting someone to make a decision, how often do ah, yes, you randomly okay. select? Yeah. But, but again, I think it's, if it, it's being honest about the kind of um, decision we want to take or the, the kind of um, process we want to have. And that's why, for example, when I presented my, my example on Cosmos, um, I, I presented one track being the citizen's track, so the democratic uh, track, uh, and one track being the aristocratic track. So, uh, and you, you know that ar aristoi, uh, the word is the, uh, comes from the most competent. Uh, so aristoc normally aristocrats are the people with, uh, or aristocracy is uh, power to the people with knowledge. So maybe you can have a mix of both. And we did, for example, um, two, three years ago, we did the process where we had, uh, it was on um, vaccination, uh, mandatory vaccination in France. It was before COVID. Um, and we had a group of uh, citizens working on that. 
and a group of uh, physicians, um, uh, doctors, uh, and doctors randomly selected from France and uh, citizens. And they worked separately uh, on the uh, recommendations, uh, and then um, they worked jointly on a common report. And that was very powerful because both of them came with maybe 90% the same, and then at the end, the 10% where they didn't agree, they had to, to discuss it uh, between those, those two tracks, the, the, the professional track, let's say, uh, and the citizens' layman, uh, laywoman track. That's fascinating. What was that, uh, uh, what was that called? It was, it was called the um, Jury Citoyen uh, on uh, Vaccination in France. All right, thank you. Adrian, do you want to jump in next? Sure. You can hear my microphone, I think. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to comment similar to Jonathan. It's similar to what I had put in the chat. And I think as soon as I allow someone to represent me as a voter, I can't be a subject matter on everything. So even in an ideal world, perhaps I do want a representative at some point, right? But as soon as I allow someone else to represent me, they become a uh, target for corruption, basically. I want to, if I want to exploit the system, now I only need to find these, this smaller group of actors and bribe them or whatever I need to do to uh, corrupt the vote, corrupt the language that will be displayed when everyone else votes. Um, I think you have keyed in on something with random selection, but you still create another issue where when you randomly select, if we're selecting subject matter experts, then I can narrow down on the size of the group of people and say there aren't that many subject matter experts. And then again, if you randomly select, how do you know you're getting, you know, honest actors from the DAO? You're not randomly selecting four people from a competing DAO. I do think there's definitely some merit to this idea, but I think that there's a lot to explore in preventing uh, lobbying. I see lobbying as ultimately what Jonathan addressed, you know, it, it corrupts everything and keeps our system moving in a, a very capitalist direction rather than a humanist or secular direction that would benefit everyone. And I think we have an opportunity here to kind of discuss deeper solutions to the underlying problem. But I, I'm very interested in this discussion. Yes, thank you, Adrian. I think that two things, two remarks on that. The first one is um, uh, re-corruption, random selection um, in the Middle Age, in, uh, in, uh, in the Rep Italian Republic. It was used during 500 years against corruption. And the reason for that is that um, it was specifically uh, used against corruption because you could, the probability that you could uh, lobby, um, the incentives for lobbying were reduced. Because if you don't know who is going to be elected and who is going to sit uh, in, the, in the council, uh, you can't invest in that people. And when you know that after a mandate, those people are going to be out and never again in a position of decision, also, your incentives to lobby them will, will uh, reduce. And the incentives of the people will, will also reduce because they are here for one mandate and they have no interest in, in keeping, keeping on. So there is a function of random selection against corruption. But it doesn't, that's, that's the external function of random selection because it's also that um, it reduces the probability that you are successful uh, with corruption. And that's very, very interesting and very important. Um, now, for the, the group itself, um, of course, um, you, you have the risk, uh, and the risk is the same as in the representative government, classical one. Uh, what, but what you don't have, if you, what we do sometimes when we do those uh, randomly selected groups, um, we have, uh, so they, we randomly select them, they come uh, in a place which is not uh, public, um, they have these four days of deliberation, and after that, they are out. Uh, so in a way, you again reduce the, the capacity for people to um, try to influence them. What we do is we are very explicit in inviting many people to give their view on the topic to the group. So it's, it's not it's lobby, but lobby in the sense of presenting a view, a perspective on the topic. Uh, so it's an open uh, lobby, and what we publish is always the people that have interacted during the process with the citizens on the deliberative group. And that's uh, something, but corruption, and but where I agree with you is we will need a, a lot of experimentation to understand the right parameters for that. Okay, 
I'll jump in if I can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I definitely see the benefit of the random selection, uh, fighting corruption, and the, um, the transparency. I think those are two very powerful aspects to making things less corrupt. But when we're using the technology that is blockchain, so ultimately the problem is money in that aspect. The the transparency and the random selection gets rid of money from the equation. But we're using blockchain, which is rooted. The technology itself functions because it's associated with money because you have this incentive to form consensus on a technical level so when you, you talk about like leapfrogging into a new paradigm it I, I struggle to fully grasp it because there's like in the, the space fought against venture capitalism for a while to try and keep it out of the out of so we don't get money and that corruption those people coming into to just like own every blockchain but now we're seeing VCs come in like crazy and just take up the native tokens of all these blockchains that would run on the technical level, the system you're describing. So how do you leapfrog into a new paradigm when you have a system that's, or a, techno, uh, uh, a foundation in technology that requires money that is being uh, essentially monopolized by lobbyists already? I mean, that's a hard question, but I think here the, uh, what, what I would answer is um, is blockchain is a tool, so you can use it for devil or you can use it for good. And like every technology, we will have to fight um, on the principle level, on the value level. And that's that's where again, for me, the so I did in, in, in December, so a, a couple of months ago, um, I, I am part of a, a DAO um, and we I proposed to design and moderate our uh, funding constitutional process. And we did a two days um, workshop, uh, which is called the Future Search Workshop, which is one of the a very, a very good known methodology of deliberation. And this methodology uh, starts with uh, finding out the common values um, and the, the having a vision, vision and value. And you, you spend a day doing that. Um, and what we saw as a group that actually money was uh, an important thing. But then when we when we started to, to think about the values behind why is, is money important, the value behind them were very humanistic, um, forward looking values. Um, and that's what very often happens with those deliberative processes that you are able to to level up the discussion when we do a process on um, on, on climate, for example, or climate change. It's, it's fascinating to see how people start to connect to the long-term um, vision um, and then come back to the recommendations. And when they come back to the recommendations, they propose things that we that is going to harm them. And we had a very interesting process in France around the, the climate plan for France. And the, we had 150 citizens randomly selected and half of the proposition they made were going as a um, as a group uh, to have a imp financial impact on themselves. Uh, but they, 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 were, they were willing to propose that uh, because they, they saw the evidence, they saw the, the discussion, and then they decided that. So my, my answer to that is, is how do we enshrine the technology in a, in a set of values? And you, we, there are a lot of initiatives in the blockchain space around the universal basic income, so money, but uh, directed to, to that. Uh, or other, so I think that's the fight indeed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are there, do you have a, a quick link to all these studies you're mentioning? Because they sound very interesting. I'd love to, to read up on them. Yeah. We have, yes, we can. that's the project we do actually as, a, as Mission Public. Yeah, and I'm happy to, to follow up with you, Anton, to get some of those yeah. links and we can share that in the community. And if you ever want to hop in our community Discord and, and open to answering any of those, any additional follow-up questions or anything that might come up, uh, that would be great. But yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join and, and present some of this work and uh, appreciate the conversation that come up. And I feel like there's a couple of interesting threads we can go ahead uh, and potentially keep exploring in future discussions. Because I, uh, both John and Adrian, amongst others, brought up a bunch of great points that I feel like we can dedicate uh, many, many hours to and to delving into and unpacking uh, and how much this space is truly living up to its uh, stated ethos versus uh, recognizing the realities and what's happening and how it's rolling out and how we can be more intentional. But again, thank you, Antoine. Thank you to everyone who stuck around uh, with us, even though we're running a little over. 
And yeah, thank you all. And we'll make sure to share the, the video link as soon as it's up and enjoy the rest of your day. See you and thank you for your attention.